Alba Har Tower is known for its kinetic facade, which dynamically adapts to sunlight. This responsive system reduces heat gain while maintaining visibility, making it a great example of sustainable architecture. In this video, we'll break down how to recreate this facade in Grasshopper. We'll explore generating the paneling system, the logic behind its movement, and finally, exporting it to a real-time renderer of your choice. To keep things clear, we'll start with a flat surface, but you can use any curved or custom shape. We'll reference it in Grasshopper and apply triangular panel B, which allows us to control the pattern using U and V divisions. Most of the generated panels are isosceles triangles, except those at the borders, which we will remove. If we visualize the order, we can see the triangles arranged in horizontal rows. Once a row is filled, the sequence moves to the next. To filter out the unwanted triangles, we'll group all cells in the same row. In this case, we have 10 groups, and from each group, we'll remove the first and last triangle. This leaves only uniform triangles that cross the surface. Let's partition the triangles based on how many are in each horizontal row. Since dividing into equal segments creates one extra row, we'll use x plus 1 from the U division to set the partition size. We can achieve this using the expression x plus 1. Looking at the order, each partition follows a sequence from 0 to 15. From each group, we'll remove the first and last triangles by their index, 0 and negative 1. Now, let's group this setup and name it Base Triangle Panel. Set U to 2 and V to 2 to focus on smaller panels. We can increase the count later. Let's reroute here and keep the same name before moving to the next step. These smaller subpanels are subdivisions of the panels we created, so we'll simply divide them further. Let's take the base triangle and from each segment, find the midpoint. Then, we'll draw a line to the circumcenter, not the centroid, and I'll explain why later. We will extrude this line to the endpoints of the segments, giving us six subpanels within each triangle. Now, in Grasshopper, let's extract the edges of each panel, get the start and end points, and find the circumcenter by fitting a circle through the corner points, since the circumcenter is also the center of the circle that fits these points. We can use this circle as a point, which internally converts to the center. From here, we'll create a line from the midpoint of each edge to the circumcenter, and then extrude this curve toward each control point or corner. Keep the data structured properly. We'll match the hierarchy by graphing here. Each subpanel is hinged to three additional elements to create the gap between them. Let's scale each panel from the midpoint of each side and set the center of scaling to either the average of the control points or the midpoint of each edge. Now we can control the gap between them using the scale factor. I'll leave this gap visible. Let's group this and name it subpanels along with the output for the next step. Now that we've finished all the subpanels, let's focus on rigging them. The idea is to take the edges of each subpanel and manipulate them based on some rules so we end up with opening and folding results. Let's extract all necessary edges and directions for the next step on the surface. We will extract each boundary edge and split each into three different outputs using the list item component. I'll zoom in and add two more inputs for each side. Each output represents a right angle triangle. C, the hypotenuse or long side of the panel, B, the adjacent side for this point, and A, the opposite side of this corner. We need the normal direction of the main panel, so we know which direction to push the center of each subpanel. Let's go back to our base triangle panels, copy them here, and bring them to the front. This will determine if it's planar or not using this component. Of course, it's planar, all triangles are. We'll take the plane and then the Z component. If we take our result here, we have only four items, but here we have six times more because we have six panels per each base panel. So we can just duplicate this six times, giving us 24 items. We'll graft it so both have 24 branches. I don't want to keep the order, so I will invert it. This way, it just duplicates the first one six times and then passes to the second one instead of duplicating the entire order. I will take the unit vector of it, which makes it easier for certain calculations. Let's group this and name it normal vector and this one's subpanel edges. I'll reroute all outputs and give them proper names so we can get ready for the next step. Let's focus on the long side of the triangle ends, bring it in with the normal direction. On this side, I will find the end point and create a line back from start to end. This has no effect, but in the middle, we can move the start and end point so that the entire edge will follow it in between here. We will move this point in the normal direction. 
I will take our unit vector and use amplitude to give it our target values and set it for translation. Now, this point moved in the opposite direction from what I thought. Let's go back to the start of our setup here. We will add a reverse surface, which allows us to flip the UV direction, and so the normal also flips for the entire setup. Now, we'll add a value from 0 to 3, so we can choose which direction to flip. Now the point is moved to the opposite direction from before. We can replace this new point now. The line also moves while this point is moving, but it's kind of stretching since one side of the line is fixed. If we track the change in length by recording it, we can see a curve graph instead of a straight horizontal line. This means the length of the curve is changing. To fix this, we have to move one side of a line inward to absorb the change in length. We are going to move this point, but this time we just slide it toward the start point. But this is moving out, so to invert the direction I will add a negative component in between here. Now the point is sliding toward the start point, but the question is, how much does it have to slide in this direction? We are trying to create this red line. When this yellow node moves in a normal direction, this red point must move inward to keep this line constant. This is the same problem as the wall and ladder problem we see in elementary math books. Let's say this is the tip of a ladder. If you slide it into a 90 degree wall, the start of course must move inward. The same is true if you move this red node inward, the yellow node must move up. In our case, the yellow point is the amplitude we set for the normal direction earlier, and the red displacement is how much we want to slide. If the line is sleeping, the total length from the corner to here is C. If the ladder starts moving X distance inward, we have an unknown floor length, let's say B. If we know this length, we can simply determine X. Also, the ladder forms a right triangle. From the Pythagorean theorem, we know that A squared plus B squared equals C squared. So B becomes the square root of C squared minus A squared. To know X, we just need to subtract C minus B, which is C minus the square root of C squared minus A squared. This means that when we move the yellow point up, the red point must move inward by this much. In our grasshopper setup, the red line becomes C, the hypotenuse we named earlier. We will measure its length and use it as our C variable for the equation, just like the red line, and the amplitude is A. Let's replace the new point and check if the change in length remains constant. As we can see, the graph is a perfectly horizontal line, meaning the length of the line stays fixed. I'll group this and name it triangle side C length preserved motion. Next, we tackle the blue side from the panel. To avoid any confusion with the side naming we did earlier, I'll rename A to AMP. For our next step, we need curve B, curve A, the normal vector, and the amplitude value. I'm going to move these over here so we have a bit more space to work with. Here's this curve. We're going to move it using the same value we used earlier, so it intersects with the previous curve. We can take the multiple of the amplitude and the normal vector for our translation. We need to rotate it inward, so when the amplitude increases, it behaves like folding. Now it's rotating in the world axis, which is not quite what we want. We need to set a relative plane for each curve. So what we're going to do is take the translated curve, Evaluate a point on this curve, this will be our origin, and use the same curve as the x-axis. We'll take our normal vector as the y-axis. This gives us a plane that's aligned for each panel. We set this as our plane of rotation. Now we can control how much it folds using the angle of rotation. Next, we take this curve and extrude it to the start of the previous curve. So we're going to take the previous curve, evaluate a point on it, or simply use the end point, and that could be our target extrude point. The base will be our rotated curve. Now we have control over the fold. But when you rotate this, the area won't stay fixed for sure. So the question is how much does it have to rotate in terms of amplitude values so it behaves like it has a constant area? So we need to figure out how the amplitude and rotation relate. I've got two expressions here. Just copy them and then paste them into the expression editor. They both do the same thing, but the shorter one uses some more advanced math. I'll also include how I figured out these formulas, you can check that out later if you like. But for now, just copy, paste, and let's use them here. Alright, so what we'll do is take both side curves, measure their length, and then take the amplitude as it is and plug it in. This is going to give us the rotation amount. I'm going to use the shortest version since both give the same result. Let's see what happens when we tweak the amplitude and how the panels react. I'll just move this tracker setup and the amplitude value to the end of the script so we can see the change better. 
But this time, instead of tracking the length, we'll track how the area changes. We'll grab one of the panels, measure its area, record that, and visualize the changes with a quick graph. Take a look. Now when I change the amplitude values, the panels fold and look at the graph. It's perfectly straight, like horizontal. The panels fold like origami, so their area should stay the same. Okay, let's clean this up a bit. I'll name it Subpanel Area Preserved Motion. In the next few steps, we'll see how we can apply this to a large-scale building and export our animation for rendering. Let's bring the subpanels we made earlier to the front. These are the ones we'll be animating. The panels before they move, no translation, nothing. And here we have the new panels that are already folded. So we need to find out how much movement is needed between these two stages. Let's check the data structure. The first one has 12, but here we have it twice. So I'll just graft it so they both have the same data structure. Now we're going to use the orient component, which gives us a transformation output. If we fit the original panels to the new folded panels perfectly, that means we just get the transformation matrix. For the source plane, we evaluate it at the center, take that plane as the source plane, and I'll reparametrize it to make sure we get the center. We're going to copy this and do the same for the target surface. Now we can see the panels are oriented, but it looks like the plane is flipped. So we'll use the same trick as before, reversing the surface. And in between here, we just have to test the different flipping options until we get a perfect orientation. Let's group this and I'll name it Transformation Matrix. So from this, we only need the geometry before orient as a mesh and the transformation to export as FBX. I'll just flatten both outputs since we only need lists. Now our setup is done. We can use the Lumion Exporter plugin. Just connect mesh to mesh and transformation to transformation. For the keyframes, let's say we want a 5 second animation. That's 5 times 25, so 125 frames. Then, just click the button to start the baking. But we need to tell it which value to animate. In this case, let's try the amplitude value. I'm going to rename this group Animate. We'll return to our export setup, run it, and a progress bar will appear. Once it's done, we'll know where the file is saved. The default spot is your desktop in a folder called Baked Animation. OK, now let's import it into Lumion, and after that, we can see how to use it on a large scale. To import the FBX file into Lumion, go to Place and then Import New Model. If you have multiple baked versions, select the latest one. In the options, check Import Animation and Force Double-Sided Surfaces. This corrects any exported surfaces without thickness. Place the model in your project, and if needed, add another to cover a larger area. In movie mode, create a new scene. Press record, add keyframes, set it to four seconds. You can include other animations like sun animation or time-lapse effects for your final presentation. If the target surface is flat, hold Alt and drag to copy it. But what if the surface is curved or complex? Next, we'll apply the same facade to a different surface, like maybe a circular or more complex shape. In Rhino, I have a surface. Currently, the plugin allows baking 1,000 panels at a time, so I've divided the surface into sections. In the next release, I'll extend this limit. To apply the panels, zoom in at the start of the script, right-click on the surface input, select Set One Surface, then choose the new one. Adjust the U and V direction. If you're not adding hinge detail lines, leave the scaling factor at 1. Now, bake the animation using the process shown earlier. Here's how it looks after importing it into Lumion. I keyframe the sky setting in the timeline to create a dynamic environmental effect. I won't go into a full Lumion tutorial here. For the intro you saw at the start, here's what I did. I added hinges that fold together when the facade moves and included extra details. It follows the same concept we covered so far with additional refinements. For the animation, instead of applying a constant value across the facade, I used a point attractor method. The sphere-like object, representing sun orientation, moves toward the facade, causing the panels to close. I'll leave an additional tutorial on point attractors for reference. For the environment and the rest of the model, I manually modeled the building in Rhino, using Grasshopper for the two towers. Then I imported everything into Lumion using Lysync. For the facade, I imported each section separately with the world origin set to 000. I added some effects, and here's a quick render using the facade we just created. All files, Rhino file, Grasshopper script, and Lumion file, are available on Patreon. If you want to learn more about exporting Grasshopper animations, check out this video. Thanks for watching, and see you in the next one.